Hello and welcome to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian. Is the age of privacy over? Today, we spend the hour on technology, spying, and privacy, exploring how privacy and the lack of it affect security, democracy, and society. What exactly is at stake when we lose our privacy? We have four experts with us. Helen Diesenbaum is Professor of Information Science at Cornell Tech. She is the author of Privacy in Context, Technology, Policy, and the Integrity of Social Life. She's also co-author of Obfuscation, A User's Guide for Privacy and Protest, and Values at Play in Digital Games. Michael Patrick Lynch joins us. He is a professor of philosophy and director of the Humanities Institute at the University of Connecticut. He's the author of The Internet of Us, Knowing More and Understanding Less in the Age of Big Data, True to Life, Why Truth Matters, and In Praise of Reason. Joshua Fairfield is with us. He's the William Donald Bain Family Professor of Law at Washington and Lee School of Law. He's the author of Owned, Property, Privacy, and the New Digital Serfdom, Privacy as a Public Good, and Smart Contracts, Bitcoin Bots, and Consumer Protection. Bruce Schneier also joins us. He's a lecturer in public policy at Harvard's Kennedy School and the author of 14 books, including Data and Goliath, The Hidden Battles to Collect Your Data and Control Your World, Click Here to Kill Everybody, Security and Survival in a Hyperconnected World, and The Electronic Privacy Papers, Documents on the Battle for Privacy in the Age of Surveillance. Welcome to the Scholar Circle. It's great to have the four of you here with us. Um, I want to begin with the concept of privacy itself, why we need privacy, and the compromises we're facing in today's internet age. So, uh, Michael Patrick Lynch, I thought we would start with you. How would you contextualize this? Well, I think the question of why we need privacy gets at the heart of why we want to protect information, whether it's ours or anybody's information at this point in time. And in general, right, we think that information is power. Knowledge is power. And the ability to collect information, uh, whether it's my private information or information uh, in general, the ability to collect it, to store it, to distribute it, to consume it, all those activities lead to the ability to control one's environment and often to control people. So, Abstractly speaking, from the point of view of a philosopher, the, the reason we, we are interested in privacy often is connected to the more general interest that we have in protecting and controlling information because of its ability to be used to pursue ends that we may or may not approve of. And what are some examples, what are some concrete examples that you can think of? Well, I think the sort of concrete examples that I imagine we'll be discussing today range from the sorts of, you know, information that is collected by us as we leave our digital trails of ones and zeros, or the use of our phones that we carry around in our pocket, all the apps that everybody's using on their phones that they're carrying around in their pockets right now, or maybe even listening to this podcast on, all those apps, as uh, everyone here knows and many people know, are constantly streaming and collecting data about the users of those apps including ourselves, and collecting data about where we are, what we're doing, what we're searching. And that goes for all the digital platforms and the digital search engines that we use as well, and of course, social media in addition. So in a sense, uh, a concrete example is the world of the internet around us. All of uh, the internet, the magic of the internet really (laughs) consists nowadays in the fact that it is completely a personalized information collecting environment. And it works in part, that is Google searches work so well, in part because they are able, Google is able to track the sorts of data that we leave, as it were, behind. And uh, so I think that's a particularly concrete set of examples that I gave a whole list of things where we're interacting in our, in our digital environment and our digital life in ways that allow our information uh, to be used both for really for benign purposes or seemingly benign to help us find books or buy shoes, and sometimes for less benign reasons to impose upon us certain uh, conceptions of it or to uh, get us to believe one thing rather than another. 
Well, let's bring Bruce Schneier in. Bruce, you, I believe, wrote about privacy as an inherent human right and need. How so? So I want to give two answers to your question. The first is, is privacy is very much about autonomy, dignity, being in control of how you present yourself to the world. And privacy violations are violations of that. How did they know that? Right? How did they get that information when I didn't tell them? How did I lose control of how I present myself? And that's fundamental to humanity. Right? The, the, the way I present myself to my family and my friends and my work colleagues is different. Not because I have something to hide, but because it's different context. And privacy supports my ability to do that. I want to give another very different answer. Privacy is essential to human progress. If you think about how we progress as a society, as a species, it's by trying new things and deciding that they're okay. A few years ago, gay marriage was approved in the United States. It's legal in all 50 states. And, and that, that went from impossible to inevitable. And in order to make that transition, it had to have been tried in secret in the past, and people were able to experiment, and eventually it gets accepted by society and becomes the norm. We're seeing the same thing with marijuana legalization. Without privacy, we lose the ability as individuals to experiment with change. How and so? that, means, that means things stagnate. How is it that the experimentation contrasts with the public knowledge. Are you suggesting that there has to be a long period of private experimentation? Well, um, imagine 100 years ago, 50 years ago, there was no privacy and gay sex is illegal. And anyone who does it goes to jail. Same thing with marijuana. Anyone who does it goes to jail. There's no experimentation. There's nobody who tries pot and says, you know, that wasn't that bad. And then tells their friends and the countercultural builds. If there's no ability to act in private, anything that is frowned upon today will never be experimented with successfully and society won't change. We stagnate. Would you agree, Joshua Fairfield, do you agree with this conception? I think it's one of the many different ways that we use the word privacy. They're loosely grouped around a, uh, a set of things that humans really care about, which is that we are fundamentally, our, our, our human condition is that we are alone individuals who have to function in a group in order to get anything done in our language, in our culture, in our, in our society. And so we feel significant anxiety about managing this balance between the group and the individual. And one of the many things that we've done with privacy is to try to police that boundary. We don't have a coherent set of one set of rules that governs everything in privacy. What we do have are people's growing unease, their sense that they've lost control of the data that's flowing from their devices that surround them and into this ecosystem that's been described by the others. You've actually called privacy a public good. How would you cross that for us? How would you explain that for us? Well, for one thing, let's just tie it up in very practical language to what a number of the other uh, folks were saying. Privacy is something that we need. It's like, for example, water or air. It's the kind of thing that humans thrive when they've got it. And you can see that humans don't do well when they don't. If you cram too many people into crowded housing conditions, they're not happy. Similarly, with a number of any other kinds of surveillance, people simply don't like it. They don't, they don't thrive very well uh, when pressed. But even more than that, if you look at what a lot of the problem is for what we call public good, like clean air or clean water. Um, often what we see is that there's this, this tension between what I do and what other people do, what other people do. And what I meant when I said that privacy is a public good is that one of the big problems online is not what we say about each other. I know everyone from fourth grade on gets advice in school, don't, don't, put your public data over the internet. That's, that's not the problem. Any, any seventh grader can tell you the problem is what other people say. 
that we are all busy contributing to data about each other by carrying devices, by uh, by buying these Internet of Things uh, items that create the sort of web work of constantly dredged surveillance. We provide lots of good information about each other. I'll give you a great example. I've never given any Internet service my birthday in my life. It's a useless protest. They know it perfectly well anyway because my wife entered it into her uh, calendar, and as of that point, they, they've got my birthday. So when we say privacy is a public good, I mean it's like clean air and clean water. It's the kind of thing that we have to cooperate together in order for us to have. And if each of us acts self selfishly and like a polluter, then it's something that none of us have. So that actually speaks to the concept of trust and societal trust and the need of trust. Why don't we broach that and pass that one around? How is privacy connected to trust and why is trust important? Joshua, do you want to start? We'll pass it back sure. to Michael Patrick Lynch and then Bruce Schneier and Helen Nissenbaum. Sure. We need to bring you in and talk about obfuscation. <laughs> well, oh, all right. So, so the relationship between privacy and trust is, is very complicated. Um, on the one hand, Privacy is very much, I don't trust you, therefore I'm keeping control of certain pieces of information, often about myself, away from you because I fear that you can use them either against me in a court of law or to charge me higher prices on the internet or I might just simply be embarrassed. And so if I don't trust you, I don't reveal these things. The difficulty is, is that also a deep level of trust arises in a society in which people do attend to each other's needs for privacy. And in that sense, the two go hand in hand. And for example, trust in government might deepen if we were to have reasonable rules of the road in place governing when and where the government can access this massive pool of corporate collective data. So the two go hand in hand. They're not the same thing, though. I might exercise privacy rights because I don't trust you, and I might trust a government more that does recognize those rights. I'll kick it off there and let other people respond. Let's just also talk about a concept Helen Nissenbaum wrote about, which is contextual integrity. What do you mean by that, Helen Nissenbaum? And I think that question really relates back to what you were discussing with the others um, in the previous round, because you were asking to hear about what privacy is, why privacy? And so you know, I, I want to address that, you know, what is privacy? Why privacy? And very importantly, why now? And I'm pleased that Josh raised the point about something like clean air, because you could ask a similar question about clean air. How come we weren't worrying about clean air centuries ago? So the answer in that case is, you know, uh, we became aware of air when people, when the, the level of pollution became so great that it affected people's lives and we realized that we were taking something for granted and suddenly this thing that we were taken, taking for granted was being corrupted. So the theory of contextual integrity, which is offered as an understanding of what privacy is and why it's valuable, the approach that I take in that, according to that work, is to say that privacy insofar it's valuable, is about the appropriate flow of information in society, acknowledging that information flow in society is very important, that what, what causes protest, what causes anxiety here is when we see disruptive flows of information, when there are assumptions about who can have what information about us and what conditions and for how long and what they can do with that information, then we get concerned that privacy is being violated. And because of these enormous advancements, if we like, suddenly these assumptions that we've lived by for, and I would even say centuries, are being challenged. And the approach that I take to privacy is a little bit different. I don't necessarily think that in all cases people have a right to control information. We don't have a right to necessarily at all times, and I don't know what Bruce, how you'll respond to this, necessarily have the right to be able to choose how we present ourselves to others. I think that um, there are factors that affect those sorts of things. But I like to just say, okay, privacy in that case, according to contextual integrity, 
is about the appropriate flow. And the appropriate flow of information serves both the individual's interests or the, the benefits individual, and but also it promotes societal good. And here, you know, getting to the point that Josh was making, and I, I picked up from a book that Priscilla Regan in 1995 wrote a brilliant book about privacy being a public good, a societal good, and, and a common good in which she talks about it, which is that privacy will support social institutions, not only the benefit of the individual. So that's, that's what the the project of contextual integrity is all about. It's to map this concept of appropriate flow of information as an interpretation of privacy. Just a reminder that you are listening to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian, and we're talking about technology and privacy, exploring how privacy and the lack of it affect security, democracy, and society. Well, Bruce Schneier, you were prompted in that. How do you respond to this idea? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And, and Helen has, has spent a lot of time mapping this out. And it's, I mean, it's a really good way to think about the value of privacy. What you asked in the beginning is, what is privacy? And it doesn't mean necessarily that it's, it's always good. We are, as a society, constantly balancing the benefits of sharing information with the benefits of keeping it public. And we're going to be balancing that in, throughout this century. I think that's going to be one of the big discussion points of this century. Things like medicine, uh, incredibly private information, yet will be incredibly valuable if it's in large databases that researchers have at it. Uh, someone mentioned uh, location tracking, where we all use Waze or Google Maps, which tells us how to get places based on the fact that everyone who uses the app is under surveillance. So privacy doesn't necessarily mean you always get to have it. Sometimes society's needs outweigh your individual needs. But privacy, I think, is certainly about autonomy and how we present ourselves to the world. We might not get to choose that. I mean, there are a lot of times I don't get to choose how I present myself to the world, but there are times I do, and it's not about trust. There are things I don't tell my parents, not because I don't trust them, because they're my parents. And there are things I don't tell my work colleagues, not because I don't trust them. There are things I'm not going to say on this show, not because I don't trust you, because those aren't the right context for the whatever that disclosure might be. Well, that makes perfect sense. Michael Patrick Lynch, you've also talked about dehumanization in addition to being manipulatable. It sounds sort of similar to uh, what Bruce is saying. Would you agree? In many ways, I do. Uh, I certainly agree that there's a distinction uh, to be made between the importance of trust and, and and the importance of privacy. Uh, we're not talking about the same thing when we're talking about those uh, concepts, although they're related in a lot of the ways that are already articulated and distinct in the ways that um, Bruce just indicated. Let me just say one thing I, I think is really important to emphasize in Helen's account of contextual integrity, which is, is as we just noted, really important uh, part of this field. I mean, one of the things that she was saying is that, look, you know, uh, Privacy's value, value insofar as it is valuable, has to do with the appropriate flow of information. And Helen, one of the things I thought was really interesting is that in passing, you said, well, you know, so part of the problem is, if I understood you correctly, that we're facing now is that the norms that determine what's appropriate and not appropriate information flow uh, in a variety of contexts are now unsettled. And I think that's that's a really important uh, piece of the puzzle that we're facing today, which is that variety of norms, norms about uh, epistemic norms, norms about who should know, uh, how we do know, what actually knowing is, what does it mean for me to really have your information? Those sorts of questions, big philosophical questions, are actually um, having, making a, a difference in 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 how we resolve these questions because it's not really clear how we're supposed to answer them in all contexts. And as a result, people can become legitimately confused about whether it's, you know, is it a good thing that I'm 
uh, sharing all this information, my location, and my birthday, even when, for example, I'm not entering it, is it a good thing that other people can enter information that can be yet then used to triangulate, let's say, even where I am located? Um, I mean, for, uh, in, in response to your question about dehumanization, I mean, I think that's a big question. Uh, the reason I think privacy or lack of privacy is related to humanization is that when you strip away, very simple point, when you start to strip away people's privacy, and, and this includes their information privacy, that is the privacy of their information, you begin to remove control from them. As Helen said, control is not all there is to privacy. There are times when control is not the issue, but sometimes it is, and when it is, when we strip away of people's ability to make choices, autonomy, as Joshua said, with regard to the, have autonomy with regard to their information, we are slowly stripping away their, uh, the, the parts of uh, the, their humanity in a certain way. In the same way that I mean, you might think when we put a, uh, a prisoner in, in, a, in a situation where they have no privacy, when they can be vi visible at all times, as Jeremy Bentham thought that all prisoners should be. When we do that, we come to look at them not as people that are actually capable of making choices or certain same sets of choices, but rather as objects to be viewed, to be controlled, and not as autonomous beings. That's the connection, I think, that we see fundamentally at the sort of fundamental conceptual level between privacy and dehumanization and that concept that uh, Joshua Fairfield mentioned earlier, uh, that is autonomy. So let's step now into like how much surveillance we're dealing with. I mean, we've got thousands of companies, of course, autocrats are trying to spy on their own people. I wonder, maybe Bruce, this is something you can respond to first. What are the worst possibilities or aspects of a loss of privacy, of spying? What's, I mean, we know from, you know, George Orwell, 1984 of, you know, worst case scenarios there. Is that what we're talking about now? You know, I, I really often dislike worst case examples because then we're just discussing extremes. I think the worst, I guess the worst case is the fiery death of everybody on the planet plus a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> At the same time, we have some hot zone pandemic. I, mean, I don't know. That, that sounds pretty that, bad. That, that, it sounds pretty bad, right. <laughs> and it, it, it kind of makes sense to back off that pretty quickly. I mean, what we're talking about, and, and Shoshana Zuboff says this best when she, when she talks about surveillance capitalism, that capitalism is redesigning itself to collect and commoditize our information. And we are not quite, but almost under ubiquitous surveillance. You know, the, the, our, our smartphones are an incredibly powerful surveillance device that we put in our pocket willingly every morning. And it knows where we, where we work, where we sleep, when we get up, when we go to sleep. It knows so many things. So uh, really think about the, the datification to, of all of that being used largely without your knowledge, and largely against your interests. And the point of this surveillance is not to tell you stuff that you want, but to sell you stuff you don't want right now. And that's the underlying business model. It's persuasion and control. And governments, you mentioned totalitarian governments, have those same aims in mind. And that's really the way to think about this ubiquitous surveillance. Well, that kind of links into something Joshua has also written about in terms of kind of this possibility of digital peasantry becoming digital peasants owned by software and advertising companies. How can we understand this concept, Joshua, of feudal security? Well, I think that the main historical path to follow that sort of lets you see this is that um, one of the big developments of contract law was to move us away from cooperation uh, by, by status, right? So the idea was that a local lord would say, you're going to do this for me, work for me, and you'd say, well, gee, I'd prefer not to do that. The response is, too bad, you're a peasant, go do it. We, over a range of years, have developed this system whereby people negotiate 
and I'm obviously horribly oversimplifying hundreds of years of legal history, but where we negotiate is the basis for human cooperation and we sign a contract, maybe one saying that I'll work for you. And that's a well-known shift, what we call the, the shift from status to contract. But the problem is now we've shifted all the way back from, uh, from contract back to status again in the sense that in the current state of affairs, when you click I agree, you not only are agreeing that you do not own the device, you're agreeing because of some strange twists of legal fate to two other incredibly important features. And the first is that you agree to give up your legal rights. That is, you now must go to arbitration, and that's a different conversation, but you will not, you won't see justice done in those contexts often. And so you must give up your right to go to court. And the second thing you have to do is you have to give up right over the data streams, the flows of data off of the device. You have no control over those two things. That's caused by a weird confluence of arbitration law, contract law, and intellectual property law, which would take another hour to describe if we were to do that here. But the end result of it is instead of us being owners of these devices, we're in fact the sources of data to be harvested under this trifecta of uh, arbitration law, online contract law, and intellectual property law. Helen Nissenbaum. Uh, I want to go back to a point that Michael raised um, a, little, a couple of minutes ago about norms and the norm changes. Sometimes we might, the way, the way I think about these norms, which are information flow norms, I would label them as settled accommodations that we've arrived at. So Bruce likes to see this um, as maybe moments when we we have to trade privacy off against some other important aim or value and perhaps a, in a slightly different way of framing it i would say that a lot of the habits that we've acquired over many many years in the relationships that we have and i i, I view the world through context um, one doesn't have to but it just it's just the way um, i've theorized it that we have education, we have, you know, we have governance, we, uh, we have religion, healthcare, and so forth. And when we, we share information with physicians, for example, or we share information with our parents, and I think that Bruce's example was a great one about what we do and don't tell our parents, these, these habits, are, these normative habits are settled accommodations that are not arbitrary. They, we've, we've gotten to them over many years because these norms will often be in place because they promote certain ends or they promote certain functions in society. So when technology comes along and is completely disruptive, I think the problem that we've been confronting over and over again in the past few decades, I, I think the worst thing that we ever did was take on board this um, idea that control involves a two-way, and here again, you know, this two-way contract between whoever the collector is and the data subject, because it's not that I had control over my device and all the information that's flowing in and out of it. I don't know if I could make a good decision because when that data reaches some party's hands, we all know that there's this enormous back end of analysis and then even trivial decisions about me. So you are, you know, the apocalypse is one thing, but if you go and apply for a loan and you don't get it, you know, that could be a, apocalyptic for your life or you apply for a job and you don't get it. And all this back-end stuff that's going on really defies the norms that have been in place that have protected us. So you could think about, and this is in the U.S. context, we have a constitution and bill of rights and essentially that recognizes, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but that recognizes that governments are very different in, their, in how powerful they are. And so we need to put protections in place for individuals. And one of the protections is to limit information that governments can gather. But when technology comes along, disrupts this resettled accommodation, suddenly you have powerful actors 
that have control over your fate in, and you have no idea you've lost. So the, the autonomy you've lost isn't about this particular little flow of information from my device. It's about much larger, much larger things. So the norms, I think we need to look at them. That this is something that we haven't done very much of and needs to happen going forward, is we need to figure out what norms need to change in this, this technology. Helen, suppose we had governments who had our privacy as a priority. I wonder what would some of those policies look like if government was really trying to protect our privacy? And I think this probably goes to two different strands, one being the sort of corporate data mining um, that we talked about earlier. But the other is, of course, you know, surveillance state types of data. So, Helen Niesenbaum, what would be good public interest policy if privacy was our priority? First of all, let me say what I would not do, which is figure out better ways of expressing privacy policies. Because I think that the path we've gone down for the past few decades, and this may even have come from the early days of the Code of Fair Information Practice Principle, it creates policy by insisting that it's a two-way relationship between the individual and the data collector. And I don't think that we're going to get vital good from that kind of relationship. But then the question is, what should we do? Now, my own approach tends to be contextual. So even though the United States approach to governance, which is what to call sectoral, you know, medical privacy, commercial, financial privacy, educational privacy. I actually think that if we did that kind of analysis well, we could achieve much more because we would be asking questions like, what are the values that healthcare should serve? What are the values that education should serve? And how should the data flows what should constraints be on the data flows that we can avoid harming individual interests and at the same time serve these important societal goals? So that would be the direction. And I think we could manage it. And then you can have people like myself, you know, privacy theorists. We don't belong really around that table. We, we need the, the area expert around that table to advise us on the information that's needed in the public interest. Joshua Fairfield, what, what would you say to this? Well, I think for a reasonable policy, it doesn't get much more practical than to look at what Europe's done. That's certainly what has gotten most people's attention worldwide. And a lot of the future of this debate really depends on whether or not um, Europe kind of makes it as a polity and continues to have that strong effect, especially surrounding privacy law worldwide. But they've certainly advanced, and the nice thing is they've been tested for the better part of 20 years, uh, a number of different approaches, and some of them seem to, um, seem to speak to our evolving understanding of this new data environment, things like uh, per purpose limitations to say, to help begin dealing with the problem that when people de sell their data, they really don't tend to price into it the fact that the data is going to be sold and resold and passed on to uh, third order, fourth order, fifth order, buyers and so on. And when that happens, then, then they really kind of lose the plot. So I think one thing we can practically do is just look at, is look at the EU and decide whether we want that or not. Um, it's a good source of experiments. But the other thing that's going to have to change that a number of people have alluded to is what it means to consent to anything online. The idea of autonomy of, no, it's okay. This person can do X, Y, or Z because I said it was fine. I consented. And the problem is, is that everyone knows it's broken. Everyone knows the current system of hitting I agree and then having all your data sold forever doesn't work. And nobody's got a really good idea of what to do about it. If I had to pick one big policy debate and discussion, and it goes really deep, we can say, you know, on a simple level, oh, consent is, you know, opt out on one side of the Atlantic and opt in on the other side of the Atlantic. That's fine. But I saw a complaint, for example, the other day, a European complaint where they were saying, yeah, there are certain things you can't consent to, like broadcast uh, the broadcast release of information during an automated bidding process for 
the online advertisements. That, that you simply can't consent to that kind of massive broadcast of your data. So we're going to have to come to an agreement about what it means to agree to something in principle or in part online. And that, that debate's only just getting started. Bruce Schneier. So consent is very much the old way of dealing with computers. Right? Then they are our laptops and our cell phones that we visit. We visit websites. We visit things. We can consent or not. And yes, that's broken, but that's gone now. You walk into a store. There are cameras. There's no ability to consent. There's a, uh, an airplane flying over your city. Uh, collecting surveillance data. There's no button to consent. There's no button to consent when you're tracked by your by your phone. Right? You know, computers are now in our environment, and the notion of notice and consent is failing in a major way. And I think when we look at regulating privacy, regulating data, we have to look at all aspects of it. And, and I did write a book on this, Data and Goliath, where I talked about ways to regulate data collection data use, data reuse, data storage, data deletion, data accuracy. I mean, these are all going to be near-term fixes for what, what Helen rightly says is a much deeper conversation we need to and probably won't have anytime soon. So we really need to look at the entire data ecosystem and figure out what we can do. And, and in some areas, we're not going to get privacy. I mean, you can imagine a future where it would be illegal for you to not put your medical records in the giant global database that we're all using for research because that would harm everybody. But in some cases, your data is necessary maybe for a short time. Right? I mentioned ways before. That data is good for 10 minutes. Right? Then it's useless. So different data is going to have different rules. And we will be debating this really for the rest of the century. Michael Patrick Lee? Oh, Helen Nissenbaum? I just want to jump in because what I would love to do, Bruce, is in the case you gave, like, okay, perhaps um, going forward, given what we know about diseases and environmental toxins and so forth and research, that it may be required for individuals to provide data towards the greater social good, is that we don't call that private because that could be quite compatible with privacy. We could argue that that flow of information is an appropriate one and therefore it's compatible with privacy. And for the kind of old fashioned way that computer scientists use the term privacy as the release of any data at all, for better or for worse, we just, you know, we use the term secrecy so we don't confuse ourselves about what we're giving up. Giving up information doesn't mean giving up privacy. Michael Patrick Lynch. I think the exchange between Helen and Bruce there was really super helpful because I think it underlines something that has been running through this conversation, which is that on the surface, we've been talking about privacy, but again and again, we return to these more basic fundamental issues about the flow of information and the flow of data and the knowledge that we glean from that data information. Uh, as I said at the top, you know, knowledge is power. And one thing we know about power is that power corrupts. And the more absolute knowledge that we seem to, and information we seem to be able to glean from each other's activities or are gleaned from our activities passively or actively online and off, the more it seems that we're open to that power that comes with that knowledge and information being corrupted. I think one of the real issues here is that it has sort of been dawning on me, not just in this conversation, but in conversations like this in the last couple of years, is that the concept of privacy itself, like the concept of consent, is complicated, important, super valuable, just like the concept of consent and just like the concept of autonomy. These concepts, perhaps unsurprisingly, given the unsettled nature of the norms, are often too rough, too function for different purposes, made to function, tools constructed for different purposes. And perhaps because of that, not fitting perfectly into the keyhole that we want them to now fit into. They're not unlocking the, the puzzle that we're really concerned with, which concerns the flow and the control that we have, not of, again, our privacy, but of information in general. That's the problem that I think our society is facing right now. And if I add, may add one other note, which brings us back to the very question of why all this matters. 
I mean, one thing that we matter, we've talked about surveillance capitalism, really, I agree, super important idea. The other thing that something to think about is the weaponization of information. Information is increasingly uh, the information pool, so to speak, that is, as it were, sloshing around out there on the boundaries of the Internet. That pool can be increasingly weaponized, not just by totalitarian governments, but by, you know, allegedly democratic governments like our own. Witness what's happened with the, you know, the stealing of various tools that the NSA has developed to operate on our information. And I think that the sorts of what has been taken from the NSA and has been used by nefarious actors to, let's say, shut down the city of Baltimore, those sorts of activities are just one illustration of how information can be super dangerous. And therefore, the sorts of questions that we're asking, the sorts of questions that Helen and the rest of you are all flagging are questions that are, you know, super vital for us to answer as human beings and as democratic citizens right now. And what would you add to that, Joshua Fairfield? Well, I think that point, that final turn to democracy, has been sort of underscoring our debate. And I think that's something that's well worth putting out into the open. I think it's worth exploring the possibility that this idea that privacy is dead or that privacy can't be regulated reasonably. It, 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 first of all, it's just not true on the facts. We can we have regimes that have privacy in place. What I think we're hearing, though, is this surveillance capitalism profit model, and it de- definitely does not want to be regulated. And with that comes this idea that maybe it's not simply a matter of this can't be done by law, but maybe we're being told this can't be done by law by people who really profit from us not having reasonable uh, protections in place. And I don't want this to take a political swing at all, but I had the joy of uh, heading up a conference, a very, very small conference in on memory of a good friend. And um, one of the books at the conference was a series of articles on the rise of different populist movements worldwide. Um, and I have to say that worldwide, a number of governments are coming to power that would deeply misuse or could deeply misuse these this sort of structure of commercial surveillance that then gets repurposed for government purposes. Um, and so I do think that the two issues do flow into each other. And we, uh, I've said often at talks that any, any culture that refuses to get this question right isn't going to exit the century as a liberal democracy. Just a reminder that you are listening to The Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian, and we're talking about technology and privacy, exploring how privacy and the lack of it affect security, democracy, and society. So since we probably can't address directly the policy question, given all of the complications that you have all so eloquently laid out, let's turn to something, I think, Helen Nissenbaum, this is your concept, which is obfuscation. Talk to us about our own power to use obfuscation. What are you telling us about? I do want to preface this because I love that initiative and we call it data obfuscation just to differentiate it from other kinds of obfuscation. But I do want to preface this answer by saying that the solution really has to come from policy approaches writ large, and that if we carry on the way we are carrying on at the moment, and my colleagues in this discussion have really pointed to many of the important aspects of it, data obfuscation is not going to be a solution. However, what the way I think about data obfuscation is a weapon in the toolbox. Right now, we have large companies who have grown ever larger in the vacuum of regulation that we've been living in. And I should say obfuscation of these notions of control that really are not controlled at all by the individuals and have grown enormous. They've got a monopoly on large quantities of data. I mean, those of us in the field have been following this and been shouting about it, but Those who are in power at the moment, and I don't mean governmental power, I mean the commercial entities have had an absolute free run and as far as I'm concerned, effectively unregulated. So 
What data obfuscation does is that it allows individuals to utilize a tool, a little weakness in some of these surveillance systems to say that since the surveillance system are so hungry for data, we don't really, in any instances, we don't really have power, especially we, people who are not very technically able to resist and hide ourselves. We can't, at this point, it's impossible to not engage. But what we can do is feed these systems fake information, junk information. We can provide a lot of information to obfuscate certain activities. Now, it doesn't apply everywhere, but the reason we think of it as a tool is that whereas the big targeted advertising powers have been able to walk away from any kind of regulation or walk away from any kind of community agreement is because there's nothing on the other side. There's nothing for them. There's no downside to their behaving as badly, as willfully as they like. And so the idea of data obfuscation is to set up systems whereby the way people protest is by feeding the system inaccurate information so that the companies who are counting on this kind of analytic power are not going to be certain that the inferences they draw are accurate. Now, we've performed a few demonstration projects, and unfortunately, one of them has a very sad ending, and that is that Google Chrome Store simply banned us, huh. and, and there was nothing we could do about it. Mm. So, I mean, there, yes, we can fight back using data obfuscation, but unless we get protection for this ability, I think it's not clear how much we can gain from it. So when you say data obfuscation by means of, I think the word you used in one of your papers was noise, and what you're saying now is giving inaccurate data. So what would be just a concrete example of, you know, how to sort of thwart the data gathering system? Like, would it be a regular sort of feeding it inaccurate data, like putting really silly things into search engines? Well, so the... I don't know about silly things. We do have one product that's called Track Me Not, and it's it's quite old. I mean, it's been going for more than 10 years. It was put out in 2006. And what it does, it's a free little system that you can download, and it sends fake queries. At this point, actually, it sends fake queries into all search bars. It used to be just search engines, but actually you could install it in your Amazon search bar, so it does these fake queries. There's a lot of pushback. You know, the community argues that, oh, you know, the companies will detect and they'll just uh, erase the inaccurate automated queries and so forth. And we've done some studies. Other people have done studies. But that's an example. Track me not as an example. Another example, the one that got banned, is ad nauseum. And what it does is clicks on um, all the ads on a page on, on any website. Now, again, there's so much data that companies like Facebook and Google are getting, you know, they're not just getting it from your behaviors. They often just buying masses of data from each other. They're getting data from data brokers. So it's a little bit of a drop in the bucket, but our hope here is that lots of people will create and lots of people will participate. Not as a solution to, the, that's the really important thing. None of this is a solution and it's a tool. But we still need the regulation that all of my colleagues on this discussion have been suggesting. Any other ideas for how to deal with this, you know, sort of as a society, sort of bottom up, sort of if we don't have a government we can rely on to help us develop good policies, what do we do? Joshua Fairfield, what do you say? I think there is one other big decision to be made. And again, it, you can sort of look at the difference between the US and a number of other similar countries in the EU and make a decision. Everybody wants some degree of protection as regards this interface between what Google knows or what private companies know and what the government can get their hands on. And the two big models are uh, the US's model where the United States government is supposed to be restricted in terms of the data that it collects and the reasons for which it collects it. Um, however, private companies are free to gather 
almost whatever they want. Helen said it exactly right, that it's sort of the Wild West and has been for entirely too long. So with respect to the American system, private companies can gather what they want, and then the government can simply get access to it either through smoothed arrangements by payments or because they can uh, require disclosure by law. The EU system is different. There, the governments are pretty unrestrained in terms of what sort of data they can directly seek. It's the private companies that are more restricted in terms of what they can gather and retain. And I'll say this, it's maybe been a more interesting system to do it that way than the American system, or at least the American system has had this big uh, wound in the middle of the constitutional order, which is fine, the government is supposed to be restricted, but they're not really because they can get their hands on anything that a third party has uh, through something called the, the third party loophole um, to the Fourth Amendment. So with that in mind, I think that's a big policy decision we're just going to have to make overall. What's the default here? Bruce Schneier? So you asked, what can people do without uh, government help? And, and, and the short answer is, is, is nothing. I mean, this data is not under our control. Advice like don't have an email address, don't have a cell phone is, is kind of stupid advice for living in the 21st century. This is what the market gives us. Without government intervention, this is what we have. We have this effectively corporate surveillance state that right, government is piggybacking off of. Whether good governments or bad governments, all are doing it. And government is how we act collectively as citizens. And that is what's missing here. And it, it's hard to say that in this, in the United States, which is very small government, libertarian, companies should do what they want, but it's not working for us. And if we want to fix this, we need to have government be a pushback. There really isn't a way, there isn't going to be a, a series of things you can do. And, and certainly those data, data poisoning uh, tricks are, are helpful, but they're around the edges. They're in the noise. They're not going to solve the problem in the main. But government's what's been missing and what we need. Final words, Michael Patrick Lynch. What can we do? Well, one thing we can do is educate each other. I share the cynicism that many of my colleagues have about our ability without government to do very much, to address the problem directly, to take direct policy actions or direct individual actions to address the sorts of problems we've been talking about. But with one exception, and that is, I think uh, we need to uh, not just educate ourselves individually, but we need to lobby for and support efforts to educate people more broadly about, first of all, A, how the internet actually works, how the flow of information is managed, what your phones are actually doing, what personalization is, and, you know, simply the very facts of the digital world infosphere, which surrounds us all. I think without that sort of effort at education, it's going to be very difficult to get people to understand the importance of coming up with policies, which are indeed important to address this problem. Without them, they're not going to be solved. We do need policy interventions and we need political interventions, but we're not going to get the right ones and we're not going to get maybe any at all. And we're going to lose a whole grip on our democracy if people don't start understanding the problem. It's tough. Well, I hate to leave it on that note, but I think we're going to have to, given the time. Let me thank all four of you for joining us here on the Scholar Circle. It's been very enlightening. We appreciate very much your sharing your knowledge and your research and your thoughts with us and our listeners. Bruce Schneier, Joshua Fairfield, Helen Nissenbaum, and Michael Patrick Lynch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Helen Diesenbaum is Professor of Information Science at Cornell Tech. She is the author of Privacy in Context, Technology, Policy, and the Integrity of Social Life. She's also co-author of Obfuscation, A User's Guide for Privacy and Protest, and Values at Play in Digital Games. Michael Patrick Lynch is a professor of philosophy and director of the Humanities Institute at the University of Connecticut. He's the author of The Internet of Us, Knowing More and Understanding Less in the Age of Big Data, True to Life, Why Truth Matters, and In Praise of Reason. Joshua Fairfield is the William Donald Bain Family Professor of Law at Washington and Lee School of Law. He's the author of Owned, Property, Privacy, and the New Digital Serfdom, Privacy as a Public Good, and Smart Contracts, Bitcoin Bots, and Consumer Protection.
Bruce Schneier is a lecturer in public policy at Harvard's Kennedy School and the author of 14 books, including Data and Goliath, The Hidden Battles to Collect Your Data and Control Your World. Click here to kill everybody, security and survival in a hyperconnected world, and the Electronic Privacy Papers, documents on the battle for privacy in the age of surveillance. And that's it for today's show. Thank you to all of our guests and to those who make this program possible. To Sud Dongre, our webmaster, Ankine Arasian, Melissa Chiprin, Mike Hurst, and Tim Page. Most of all, thank you for listening. If you missed part of the show, you can check out our archives at scholarcircle.org, kpfk.org, and please like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Armodian, and we'll see you next week.